Thanks for having me. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, to start, I want to uh, follow protocol and acknowledge that we're on the unceded traditional territory of the Wendat Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, and the Métis Nation of Ontario. So thank you for inviting me to be a visitor here. While I'm here, I try to tread lightly because I am a visitor, um, and that will be sort of implicit in some of what I'm talking about. How do you tread lightly when you go to new places? How do you tread lightly in your research? What does that mean? So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to start with a traditional form of oral address called 185. 185 pieces of junk walk into a bar, and the bartender says, we don't serve junk here. <laughs> and the junk says, why? And the bartender says, already wasted. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going well. Okay. 185 pieces of junk walk into a bar, and the bartender says, oh, we're not serving junk tonight. And the junk says, why? He says, because it's ladies' night. <laughs> <laughs> That's the past term that said yesterday on masturbation. 185 pieces of junk walk into a bar and order around. The bartender hands them a bill, and the pieces of junk say, oh, just put that on our super fun. <laughs> 185 pieces of junk walk into a bar, look around, and say, oh, disintegrate place. <laughs> walk into a bar and the bartender says, oh good, you're here just in time for the idea swap. I want to flop some ideas past you. <laughs> and here we are, flopping ideas. So the good thing about junk, uh, about, well, junk also, but puns, besides that they're a very geeky form of joy, because I enjoy, uh, is that they, they're about uh, parallel concepts and they're about jumping the tracks and overlaying concepts on top of each other, which is also the job of a keynote. So what I'm going to do is try and use 185 as a format to think about some of the different concepts that we've been talking about for the last day and a half, and we'll continue to talk about uh, after this, about theorizing junk. Um, and then I'll get into my own work and how I try and use those concepts essentially as uh, ethically as possible and work them into every part of my research. So the first theme that's running through a lot of the work that's been presented is that, number one, <coughs> politics by which I mean struggles pertaining to power, is accomplished through exclusion. That's the form of the joke. We don't serve you here. Now, uh, in a lot of theoretical work, you call this externalization, right? It's a, it's a mechanism of power. Um, in uh, economics, externalization is about deferring objects or costs or harm to other groups and places so that those are not uh, affecting the center, affecting the internal. And if you've read Mary Douglas, you know that uh, externalities keep the center in place and are a primary method for coherence for whatever the center is. Um, so it's about maintaining centers and peripheries, regardless of whether those centers and peripheries are material, social, or any combination of those two things. Number two, uh, junk is characterized by a temporality and the deferment of objects, status, or value. So this is part of the represent, uh, one of the presentations we saw before lunch, where junk is actually different than waste, pollution, disposables, et cetera, et cetera, because it's uh, in between the, the periphery and the center. It's sort of, the, uh, sort of the waiting, what Heidegger would call a standing reserve, there to be drawn upon later, maybe, but at least available for that. So it's sort of material on call uh, for the extraction of value, et cetera. Number three, junk is capable of return, even if you've externalized it. Right? So even if junk becomes waste pollution, et cetera, we've pushed it out, it can always come back. And this is especially true, I'll talk about this in a second, as we start to make material waste that is permanent as far as human species timelines are concerned. There's a sort of eternal return uh, of these objects. Number four, <laughs> junking means that something is not productive, efficient, or doesn't map onto dominant productionist values. We've had a talk uh, from our designers about planned obsolescence, um, but also that this uh, junking is disposability, exclusion, et cetera, is a devaluation necessary for capitalist accumulation. Because it moves things either through uh, the market so you can have some more market, or it devalues things so that later you can come back and it's devalued rate and capitalize on it again, which happens in rumination or different sort of uh, with property. But it's also the basis of rubbish theory. Uh, Thompson's work in 1979 that defined how something that was valuable becomes junk and then it becomes an antique that's worth more than they started with. Uh, 
and number five. Junk and waste is not so separate from the center after all. There's actually leaky borders, intimacies, and is part of subject formation. <laughs> it's not actually part of getting things out is part of what makes the center the center. And so there's always an intimacy between those. So those are our five, sort of the five uh, things I saw commonly running through what we were doing, whether we were talking about junk DNA or design or masturbation, right, across all these different uh, talks that we've been having. But so what? We have some themes now. Uh, we know a little bit more about politics and its mechanisms, its temporality, its trajectories, but you know, so what? Why are we here? Why are we here as academics, as students, as designers, as researchers? What do we get up to? And I want to answer that by thinking about jokes. So the thing about jokes is that what makes a joke funny is not the content of the joke, but the form of the joke. Jokes have a very specific anatomy that makes them very different than a funny story, which is why sometimes you think you're joking and you're not, <laughs> as I learned when I took comedy. There's an introduction I set up in a punchline. So introduction, 185 junks walk into a bar, right? And then the setup. And through the, the introduction and the setup, people sort of can see where you're going and they anticipate where you're going to end up. But the punchline takes you somewhere else entirely. And recognizing that you're somewhere else and figuring out where that is is where the laughter comes from. Right? It's where the joy comes out, which is why when you explain a joke, the joy is gone. Because <laughs> someone didn't get there by themselves. They don't get it the same way. And in my opinion, this is also fundamentally the job of discard bins and STS. We work like punchlines. It is our job to defamiliarize and reframe, particularly because what we work on, science, technology, waste, garbage, pollution, junk, are things that people already think they know a lot about because we actually deal with them every day. But our job is to exceed intuition and exceed the individual instance and get to the system. That's pretty much what we do. So a lot of people think this teeny tiny thing says sewage. A lot of people think they know something about sewage because we all poop. But the thing is, I pretty much only know about my poop. I don't know about sewage because that would be our collective poops, and I don't know about your collective poops. That would require research. <laughs> right, that's what research is. And in STS and in discard studies, what you do is you zoom out and you look at the larger system that allows the fact that I don't know what your collective poops are Right? Why don't I know that? Because if, if I was a nurse, I might. If I was a hospice worker, I might. If I was your mother, collectively, I might. Right? If I was a sanitation worker or a clear, I might. So why is it that I don't know about our collective groups that other people do? What is it that keeps us separate? What is it that me, you know, what are, what are these larger systems? Because these larger systems are actually really massive, cultural, et cetera, et cetera. And when you change one of these things, the cultural, uh, political, social, economic, et cetera, outlying structures, everything in the middle changes too, and you end up with a different network, you end up with a different what sewage means, et cetera, right? So this is, this is why you cannot intuitively do discard studies. You cannot intuitively do STS research. You need a case. You need to follow it the whole way through because you're looking for a structure that has made some things external and some things internal, and you can't see how that's doing that by yourself. You can't intuit that. That's why this is a research-based, case-based set of disciplines, including the history. When I say STS, I include the history of science and technology. I know this is a style for people to say, oh, STS at York, and then like this history thing at 15, and I don't get the black and to mean different, but, but it's, it's for all of that, right? That's what we all do. So, okay. So why is this important? Why is it important for us to know about systems that externalize and internalize? Well, number one, it's about power. If you have a system that keeps some things in the center and some things on the outside, that's just power, right? That was our first slide, that was our first theme. And because we're all studying power, implicitly or explicitly, whether you're looking at materials or social or whatever, you're looking at power. And because of that, you're also, whether implicitly or explicitly, looking at justice. Right? There's an ought to our research that is different than some other disciplines. It's, it's sort of built in there. STS and discard studies are considered a, an ought, progressive, moving, moving towards, moving away from sort of set of disciplines. That's what denaturalization is for. So, What's next? Right. So what does that mean? Well, it means that part of our job is not only to deal with justice, but thinks of different modes of justice. So if you think back to one of the first and probably most dominant ideas of justice and externalities, you think of environmental justice, right? Numbing and Dixie being the classic uh, book published over and over again, whereby uh, folks found out that uh, people of color, people of low socioeconomic cla uh, class, and material waste were concurrent, proximal in space. What? Right, so our, our 
our physical, our material, and our social externalities were all pretty much the same. They were ending up in the same places, right? And this is sort of the basis of models of justice in envi for environmental justice, for waste-based, junk-based ideas of justice, to the point where people can publish these papers where they say, which came first, people of color and pollution? We know they're, but which one first? Chicken, and they're like, chicken and egg, and they get really into this, which I find, well, annoying, perhaps you could tell, because this just rehashes and goes deep into something that I think needs to expand. Um, so the problem that I have, and this doesn't mean that it's bunk or junk, this means that there just needs to be more, um, more models of justice, because environmental justice, traditional environmental justice, is about an equity, equ uh, equality model. It's a, it's a math problem. So the, the problem is that uh, some folks are disproportionately burdened by harm without getting any of the benefits, which means that if we even those out, we no longer have a justice problem. So if you get one benefit, one harm, and you get two benefits, two harms, and you get three benefits, three harms, and you get no benefits, no harms, we have therefore solved the environmental justice problem, theoretically, right? It's a math problem. But there are plenty of critiques of equality that say, yeah, but you don't start out from the same social position, so treating everyone the same in a sort of math problem where everyone is treated the same doesn't actually address the problems that put waste and people of color in the same place to begin with. For that, you might want something like, whoops, spoiler, uh, <laughs> equity, right? It tries to address different social locations to begin with, it tries to address why it is that people of color and inclusion come to the same place to begin with, which is a way harder problem than one in one and two in two. Right? In fact, we don't really know how to do this very well, so it's a struggle. So a lot of uh, NGOs start by making the equity model and then move into the equality model because it's just so dang hard to figure out and then to operationalize. And what I want to do is think with you now and for the next 30 to 50 years is what other models might there be for justice, right? What about a liberation model? What about, uh, right? I don't know. Right? And, then try, and, and then not only how do we imagine them, but then give an imagination, which is very important, how do we then operationalize them? So there are some people who are theorizing this um, because we have to. So uh, one of the things I study is endocrine disrupting compounds, which are industrial chemicals that have actually achieved the equality model because we have them all in our bodies. So there's actually a success story in that they are uh, distributed across the entire population in <laughs> uneven quantities sometimes, but luckily that doesn't matter because they have the highest effects at the lowest doses. <laughs> so that's good news, the quality model. But the, but the problem is because they're distributed in space unevenly, but, but that unevenness isn't what makes the justice problem, right? What, how it affects people unevenly is based on gender, based on age, based on other, so, so other sort of uh, vulnerabilities that aren't spatial and that don't work from a one in one to a two in three in three situation. So this is from an uh, environmental working group where they found uh, PCBs in plant farm retardants and breast milk, and then in every single person they've ever tested. Poster child, poster child chemical this is BPA, bisphenol A. We all have BPA in our body, which is amazing because you piss it out in six hours. You metabolize it and it passes through you in six hours. So for all of us to have it in our body all the time, we are being dosed from so many places that the sort of spatial metaphor of unevenness doesn't work anymore. For analytic, not just the metaphor. Which makes me think that we have to pay a lot of attention, specific attention, to materiality. Not general attention, don't forget about material, but specifically, right? Because different materialities result in different unevennesses, which means they have different relations, which means they have different analytics, different forms of intervention. So different modes of justice because different modes of injustice. And so I follow folks who um, are saying, it's not just vibrant matter and liveness and agency, it's what kind and when. So I study marine plastics. The plastics on land are fundamentally different than plastics in the water. Completely different. What you know about plastics on land does not hold for plastics in the water. And PET in the water is fundamentally different than nylon in the water. Right? And you have to get there if you're going to think about justice. Because you need to intervene in justice. And when you intervene, you need to intervene on something, with something. Specifically, particularly. So some folks are thinking about this, about justice in different ways. Um, this is a new book, Waste Landing, that says, well, you know, so this whole thing about um, environmental justice where people of color, particularly indigenous folks, and pollution end up in the same place, instead of saying, oh, people of color, stable category, waste, stable category, look at their proximity. She says that the process of pollution and the process of racialization are the same process. 
right? We need to think of them as the same process. So someone talk, was earlier was talking about white trash. Um, you can think about white trash and the dirty Irish as the two points where white people get racialized for the first time in, in terms of wasting, in terms of dirtiness and pollution. Right, not the first time, but from the white side of the fence, that's where white gets racialized most, right? Likewise, Michelle Murphy, who's sitting here with, uh, says, well, what if you take all of science studies, not just justice-based stuff, but the entire endeavor and use France and French and, and, and decolonial scholarship to rethink relations, not just settler colonialism, but slavery, right? If you, what if you back the truck all the way up and start from a different set of premises that aren't about proximity and harm, right? What if there are, there are other modes of harm that have legacies through all of this that affect how pollution works, how junk and value, et cetera, circulate? I don't know what this looks like, so I'm waiting for Michelle to publish more, <laughs> so I can cite it and keep going. And I'll be reading the rest of all that I get home to try and read that too. In terms of plastic. Friends, this plastic. <laughs> so, how does friends do plastic? How might friends do plastic, right? So, um, some of you know that recently, for the past two years since moving to Newfoundland, I have become almost exclusively a feminist marine biologist. Uh, I got there being like, yeah, let's do some theory. Turns out they didn't need theory, they needed biologists. So that's what I do. Uh, luckily, I have some training, in this, so that's all right. So I founded the Civic Laboratory for Environmental Research Action Research. It is based on STS principles and feminist science that we try and bake into every moment, everything we do in our lab. We try and tra uh, titrate like feminists. We do hot <laughs> order like feminists. We take breaks like feminists. Right? We're trying to figure out every moment in our laboratory process how do we do that? How do we decolonize this? And how do we do this like feminists? And we draw a lot on STS for that. So I'm gonna be talking about um, these ethics about externalities and centers and, and valuation. How, do you, how would you bake that into your work, no matter what your work is? Whether, you, whether you're just doing junk for the fun of it for this conference or whether you're dedicated to junk, what might you do to put some of those ethics into every, every, every moment of your research? Um, yeah. But first I'm gonna give you a quick primer on marine plastics. So that's what I'll be talking about. And not everyone reads about plastic as much as I do. So marine plastics just means plastics in the water, in the oceans, but also not in the oceans, but the not like rivers and stuff go into the ocean, so uh, the shortcut to them is the ocean. They're in every ocean in the world, including the Arctic, which is where I hang out, and uh, they tend to accumulate in gyres. Gyres are slow moving currents in every ocean in the world, five oceans in the world, five gyres. And uh, the water in the middle of these giant gyres, uh, the middle cools, and as the middle of the water cools, it drops, and everything floating on it stays at the top and then the other water swirl around it. So these are really uh, stable areas of accumulation of anything floating. So if you heard the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, the Trash Vortex, the Plastic Island, PS, not an island, I'll get fed with it. Those are all in a gyre, and it's usually the North Pacific gyre, which is the famous gyre, because it's between here and Hawaii, and that's where researchers like to go. <laughs> <laughs> I hang out in the colder gyre, the North Atlantic gyre. Uh, this summer I was lucky enough to, to work on a research vessel that went through the middle of the North Atlantic gyre, and we were dragging uh, surface trawls, which are big nets, giant plankton nets, basically, through the water, and they pick up plastics. That's how we do our research. And as we started collecting more and more plastics in our trawls, to the point where we needed more and more people to hoist them over the edge, keep in mind that plastics are extremely light, so these are a lot of plastics we're hoisting up, that signaled our arrival to the gyre. So I leaned over the edge of the ship, and I took a photograph. This is the middle of the gyre. This is the area of highest accumulation of plastics in the North Atlantic. The reason you don't see anything, yeah, people are like, I don't see it, yeah, there's nothing to see, uh, is because 93% of all marine plastics are smaller than a grain of rice. They're microplastics. This is what I mean by saying plastics that we know and plastics in the ocean, fundamentally different, just starting with size. Also, all sorts of other things, but just starting with size. So, for scale, I put this out of the Hudson River. Those blue dots, they're actually sparkly. I need to make an animated gift so it's sparkly. Uh, but they're sparkly, they're the little blue dots in your toothpaste. That's how big that is, right? So they're exfoliants. So the exfoliants in your toothpaste and on your face wash, those are called microbeads. Uh, they go through waste treatment, and almost all the time, waste treatment doesn't capture them. They go right into the ocean. They're called primary microplastics because they're more in that size. Most plastics uh, actually fragment from macroplastics, larger plastics, because plastics, while they technically biodegrade, it takes geological time for that to happen. So longer than we're gonna be on the planet. So uh, they just fragment into smaller and smaller pieces. Uh, yeah, and those are where most of the plastics come from. So the problem with plastics, the 
ecological problems with plastics. Uh, probably, you've probably seen them on TV. Uh, they entangle wildlife, right? The six packs and the choking and the ghost fishing. Uh, they act as little flotillas for ecosystems called plastospheres, unique ecosystems that float around. But when those little ecosystems hit a foreign shore, they become invasive species. So they're considered vectors for invasive species. When they sink, about half of the plastic floats, half sink, different types of plastics. Uh, when they get into the benthic environment, the bottom of the ocean, sedimenty place, um, they reduce oxygen transfer and starve out worms and things that live there. But the number one problem of plastics and to a lot of uh, my colleagues, uh, is ingestion. This is a, this is a uh, fish that one of my partners caught on our, on our research voyage, and we went to go eat it, and it was already in our research. Um, the number one problem with ingestion isn't that you eat plastics and now there's harm. In fact, we eat plastics all the time. This has nylon in it. I'm fine, it's now in my lungs, right? We eat plastic all the time. The problem with uh, eating plastics is that they absorb oily chemicals hydrophobic chemicals. So if you've ever had chili or curry or spaghetti and you put it in Tupperware and you go to scrub it and the orange color will come out, right? That's, everyone's like, yes, it did happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a manifestation of how plastics absorb up to a million times more oily substance than the water around it. A million. So when you get the poison pills, because in <coughs> abrasive acidic conditions, those chemicals come back out again, which is the conditions of the stomach. So if you want to clean your Tupperware, you need to eat it. It'll come out cleaner <laughs> from a chemical point of view. <laughs> so the problem is that these fragments are so small that plankton eat them. We have found pieces of plastic, 100% pieces of plastic, circulating in the blood of mussels, like the clam type mussels. So they translocate from the gut into the blood and cruise around. Right? So these are in all tropic levels, by which I mean all levels of a food chain. Terrestrial food chains are really short, right? Grass, cow, human. Right? Terrestrial food chains are weed plankton, phytoplankton, bigger plankton, little fish, little fish, little fish, little fish, little fish bigger, 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 marine mammal, indigenous population. Right? So the problem with this is these, these chemicals, many, many of which are endocrine disruptors, um, persistent organic pollutants, things that have very long-term intergenerational effects, they can bioaccumulate in the animal and biomimify up the food chain. Brown with the Newfoundland, people eat a lot of fish. We also have people who eat marine mammals in Newfoundland and Labrador. So you have a classic environmental justice problem in Newfoundland where people who don't benefit from the production of plastics are being harmed by the production of plastics. Right? Pretty classic EJ situation. So when I got to Newfoundland, I'm like, okay, I'm ready, let's go. Let's do some plastic stuff, activism. And they're like, oh, we don't have plastics here. I was like, that's impossible. Uh, let's go find some plastics. So I went to go find some plastics. This is me finding plastics in Bermuda. Not Newfoundland. <laughs> <laughs> the way you can find plastics, the easiest way is to do a shoreline study. The way you do a shoreline study, either standardized by NOAA and the European Union Marine Debris Program, is you do transects, which are a fancy science name for squares. You lay down some squares in a line to sort of uh, get a random sample of the landscape. Uh, in the square, you scoop up all the sand, you put the sand in a bucket, you put water in the bucket, you swirl it around with your hands, which is very scientific. Uh, the plastics all float, you put it into a sieve, and there's your sample. Representative sample of a peaceful landscape. So this is a standardized protocol. This is how everyone does it so we can compare our data across sites. Problem is, this is my research site. <laughs> this is my research site in April. <laughs> Ice and do you see sand there? No. No sand. And when we try and replicate this same research assistant, way less happy. Now he works in Fogo Island. Um, when we do, when we try and get the microplastics out of the rocks, we actually can't find the smallest ones, which are the most plentiful ones, and so we, they just fall down the rocks, and then you chase them and they go down the rocks. There's rocks all the way down in Newfoundland. <laughs> it doesn't matter how far down you go. So this is a problem. So this is, a, this is actually a, a new sort of sideline of research I'm doing, is that you can't do science in Newfoundland because standardized, universalized protocols are not built for our environment. So if you do everything right, like the manual says, you will end up with no kind of data in Newfoundland. Also, it'll blow away, uh, which is another problem we have with So what we did is we decided, so my biology lab also became a technology lab. So we're now building scientific instruments that work in Newfoundland, place-based scientific instruments. And because we do citizen science, which was mentioned in the intro, thank you. Uh, so let me back up. The reason that we do citizen science, citizen science means doing science with people who don't have science degrees, 
uh, is because Newfoundland and most of the Canadian North has very, very little infrastructure, which means very little infrastructure for folks to be around, but also for research to happen. I can get to London cheaper and faster than I can get to Labrador, which is in my province, right? And because of that, uh, and because I'm not a billionaire, um, that becomes very hard to do research across Newfoundland and into the Canadian North, which is where people are eating marine mammals, right? Okay, so what are we gonna do? We're gonna work with the people who already live there to help us collect research. So, these are the design parameters for everything we build in my lab. Number one, they have to be open source, licensed, and online, so that anyone in the North can get them, although I just saw online today that the Newfoundland government is closing down 60% of all libraries in the North, and that's gonna be a problem because the libraries where most people do their online business. So that's why I have to go back to Newfoundland and have a fight with the government. Uh, number two, they have to be built and used by accredited and citizen scientists. They have to produce data good enough for me to get peer review in the Marine Bulletin of Pollution, and they have to be good enough so that Frank, who's one of my guys on FOGO, can build it and not get cranky while he's building it. This is a pain in the ass. Uh, less than $50. $50 is actually quite high, given what the average wage in the north is. That's our ceiling. We usually hang out closer to 2030, but that's our ceiling. That's our absolute deal-breaking ceiling. Uh, Made of materials you can get on Fogo Island. Fogo Island is a, is a, do you guys know where the Fogo Island Inn is? Okay, so now people know where Fogo is. Uh, it's in the middle of nowhere. Very rich people go there sometimes now and leave. Um, but it's a, it's a little tiny fishing hamlet that was not, re, was not moved by the government like any other fishing hamlet. Uh, because the tiger is there. And so that's one of my research sites. And this photo is actually from the general store. When I say general store, I mean the only store on Fogo that isn't in the inn. The inn also has a store that they sell stuff. Um, but so I went in and photographed everything in the store, and my students can only build things from these photographs <laughs> and things you can get from the Sears catalog, which are the two ways you get stuff in the north. Right? And then the, the last one, and this is the hardest one. This is the one that my students asked me to take out of our, our uh, parameters all the time, no plastics. And the reason that we do this is, so sometimes uh, when I build scientific instruments in the lab, like I build my own microscopes, sometimes those have plastics in them because I have fancy equipment that helps me tell what plastics came from my device and what plastics came from outside. Contamination is a serious problem. I run a fleece-free lab because fleece just put microfibers in all my science and then you can't tell where it came from. So it has to have no plastics so that we don't have, we don't have to calibrate for contamination and it becomes more usable, essentially. My students ask me to take it out because it's freaking impossible. It is impossible to build something without plastics. And this actually turns into a learning moment that I didn't anticipate where they're like, I can't make the choice. It's not a choice. I don't get to choose to design like this. Plastic is everywhere. This is a freaking system. There's no outside of this system. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, I get, I get how this works. So, so it becomes this learning moment where they figure out that if, as scientists, where they have resources and catalogs and stuff, they can't make choices to live a plastic-free scientific life, nor can they make those choices right, in, in other sort of forms of activism and action. So this is what my students came up with to deal with the plastic flowing through the rocks problem. This is called the Plastic Eating Device for Rocky Ocean Coasts, or Pet Rock. <laughs> <laughs> I have awesome students. Uh, it is essentially a, it's now a roofing vent. That's what the black thing is. It's in like a cube that mimics the transect, the science squares. <laughs> You bury it, it's got a caboodle organizer on top, because everyone in the north caboodles, apparently. Uh, you can get them at all the stores and chicken wire. And on the bottom, there's a sophisticated cotton filter that is a t-shirt screwed into the bottom. <laughs> and uh, we don't wear them afterwards, because they get all mucked up. But uh, when the, as the water and the plastic, and then you bury it. And as the water and the plastics go through the devices, they get caught, you exhume them, then you do the bucket situation in the lab, extract the plastic and now we get real, real data because we get the small samples. So this is uh, released under a CERN open hardware license, uh, which is developed by CERN. It means that anyone, if, first of all, you have to have certain good documentation to have this, to earn this, which means you have enough documentation that someone could build this, they have a material list, they have a calibration list, then you can get a license. And then anyone can download your work and use it, tweak it, copy it, sell it, set it on fire, whatever they want to do, whatever, it is just out there. So this is an equity model for, trying to, for doing uh, research dissemination in terms of technology, right? It's, it's not, it's trying to be as accessible as humanly possible, and this is why we need the libraries to stay open as much. So I'm now gonna quickly talk about baby lights, uh, which is one of our other, probably our most famous piece of technology, before I do my final um, example of a method we use and close. 
So Baby Lakes has all of the same design parameters as the Peg Rock, with the exception that she's made of plastic. Um, and that is because um, her plastic is red and pink, so when she contaminates, you can tell, because it's red and pink, and there are very few red and pink plastics in the world. She has a surface trough, so she's the thing that you drag behind a boat, and she's designed so you can drag her behind a canoe or a major research vessel. She's going about five knots here, which is quite fast. It's about the fastest that a research vessel goes, and she's holding up. Um, so she skims the surface of the water, and plastics go inside, and they collect in the net, which in this case are her toes, down here. This is her in Hudson Bay, becoming filthy. Uh, and these are the plastics that she collected out of the Hudson River. Uh, the black one is a plastic bag. You never find a full plastic bag in the open ocean, because the kinetic energy of the waves just shreds those things. This is the biggest plastic bag I've ever found in the open ocean. If you find a full plastic bag, it is local and fresh. So you can tell it, it, its origin was pretty local. Um, the white dot in the middle is a piece of styrofoam, with a bead. Uh, the gray thing above it is another micro bead, and then the rest are varieties of normal stuff we find, uh, film, thread, fragments, uh, plastic. So the reason I talk about baby legs uh, is because of IP policies. She's the first piece of technology my lab built. It's actually the only solo piece of technology built by my lab. I built her um, so before I had a lot of students. And so what, if you work in a university, whether you're a student or a staff person or a faculty member, if you invent something, it belongs to the university. It's called an intellectual property agreement. Uh, Memorial actually has a very progressive intellectual property agreement where I, if I invent something for my students, I am required to disclose it to the Office of Research. Uh, the Office of Research then has 90 days to determine whether they would like to patent it. Mm -hmm. And then this is the progressive part. We then co-own the patent. And I get half the royalties and whatever we work out. In the less progressive ones, you don't own the patent, but you might still get royalties. Right? Of course, the problem with this is that patenting is privatization. And if you've privatized it, you've just lost your equity model of distribution. And so I was very, very, very interested in not having it patented, but I also did not want to break my collective agreement because I rather like that we have a union and uh, it was conflicted. So this is the invention and disclosure form that you have to, this is my permanent signature. signature. This, is what, this is pages and pages and pages. This is just the first page. So what we did, what I did was, usually uh, Baby Legs has a square opening because the math is easier on a square than in a circle. But for this particular instance, and for disclosure when you're giving the images and stuff, I got her a Palm Wonderful bottle. She's very curvy and has some hips and a waist. I put her in some really awesome tights that were white and little pink hearts on them. And then I took her to Sears to get her baby portrait done. And this is the image of the research office. They were awesome. I was like, I want to maybe picture her of this instrument. And they're like, OK. And so that happened every day. And they set her up, and they crossed her little leg. And performative manly culture, and it is entirely men uh, at Memorial. And they saw, and also, you've been noticing that I've been using the feminine pronoun to talk about this trawl. I did that in the research report, and it sort of stuck. Also, when I run around the university with baby legs, I put her in a baby yarn. <laughs> so I've been performing baby legs for a while. And when this came up, the research office was like, are you kidding us? Don't bug us with this shit. Like, take your practical jokes somewhere else. This isn't even technology. Yes. <laughs> so now she's under Creative Commons and Sir and License. And, that, and only because. <laughs> uh, I leveraged sexism to defer capitalism. <laughs> As a method of feminist science. <laughs> so, anyway, that's why I talk about baby legs. Also, when I have her somewhere and I do a science fair or something, people are like, oh, baby legs, and they manhandle her, which is also part of sexism. <laughs> Uh, well, people do not touch our other instruments, right? So she's 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 accessible in a way. Although uh, manly fishermen also not a fan of baby legs, so we man her up a little bit when we go and see the fishermen. She's a little much. So, so the third method. And these are all about how you bait, right? This is all about ethics and how 
I bake some of these values of equity and justice into the every moment that we do in our lab, right, to try and deal with externalities, uh, social material. The last thing I'm going to talk about is biomonitoring. Uh, this is my research assistant, Judy. Uh, we go every year to the food fishery in Newfoundland. Food fishery are two weeks, two times, so four weeks in total, in September and August, where anyone in Newfoundland, if you are six years of age or older, I don't know how they came up with six, you're allowed to fish all day long and fill your freezer with fish. And that's the, even if you don't have a license. Even if any of you show up to Newfoundland, you can come fish, just during those two, two weeks. And we get on the wharfs and we ask people for their cuts. Their fish <laughs> I have tried to convince my research assistants to dress up as zombies for this. They are not <laughs> okay. um, and because the reason that we collect guts is so that we can, so we can actually sample the food chain. We're not sampling the ocean in this case. We are literally sampling food that people are eating to see if the fish are eating plastics so that we can do this justice issue on food okay. So we got in several hours to, uh, over 300 uh, fish guts. And uh, in our latest paper, we look at 200 of them, 205 of them. And as I was sitting in my lab, and I found the first plastics and the first fish, I uh, thought about what I was doing, sort of, for the first time. And I remember the 1992 cod fishery collapse in Newfoundland, the largest job layoff in Canadian history, not per capita, period. Canada is, or Newfoundland is not a populous place. It was kind of everybody. Right? Desolated the province. Oil was supposed to raise it back up, although it really only rose up the top part. Desolated again, which is why libraries are closing. And I'm about to be in a position potentially to be like, hey, Newfoundland, P.S., your cod tanked again, totally contaminated. Sorry about the center of your cultural sustenance and commercial livelihoods, totally contaminated. And then I also thought about the breast milk scare, breast milk scare, breast milk fiasco. Um, that happened in Hudson, northern Hudson Bay, also in the 90s, when medical officers went and uh, tested Inuit, Inuit women for uh, contaminants and found some of the highest POP, persistent organic pollutant contaminants, uh, in any breast milk in Canada. And the, re the way those communities found out about it was through the Globe and Mail, right? Scientists didn't tell them because they were still like, oh, what do they do? What do they do? And then the Globe and Mail figured out what to do, whether that was going to be or not. And they're like, well, this is it was about it. Um, and so the ramifications of that in those communities were both, you're, if you breast milk, if you breastfeed, you're a bad mom, because you're contaminating your kid. If you don't breast me, um, feed, you're a bad mom, uh, because now you're malnourishing your kid. Also, there's nothing, there's nothing to replace. If you're in the north, you can't just get pablum, right, depending, right? So malnourishment problems, the taboo of breastfeeding, the, the bad mother surveillance, all that, the, still going on, still going on, even though this happened in the 90s. And I'm like, how, what if my lab doesn't do that this time? So what am I going to do? How do I figure out what is best for the people who are most affected by this contamination research? How do I figure that out? Uh, and I don't. I can't. How can I possibly? So I asked them. I called the community meeting. This is in Petty Harbor, where we got most of our fish guts. This is a fishing hamlet outside of St. John's. This is also the population of Petty Harbor. <laughs> <laughs> Not everyone here is from Petty Harbor, but half are from St. John's and half are from Petty Harbor, including uh, fishermen uh, and the head of the Fisherman's Union, which is very important to have your name. And uh, we presented our results, our methods and our results, and we're like, whoa, hey guys, what do we what do? What do I do? And the reason that we do this is so that we can bring some methodologies that are developed in the social science and humanities into natural science, particularly ethnographic refusal. This is an excellent post by one of our excellent graduate students named Alex Sahara on ethnographic refusal and how that's crucial when you're doing contamination work. Ethnographic refusal is not letting certain information circulate in the academy. It's not the same as censorship. It's just the idea that the researcher and the community affected collaboratively figure out how should this be represented, how does it circulate, and maybe the academy hasn't earned this. And I would say in almost all cases, they're probably right. right? Maybe we need to send this to Sashashwani Nation. Maybe we need to send this up to the Inuit uh, uh, Tribal Council Band. Maybe we need to send this to the Fishermen's Union. But maybe we don't send it to Memorial University of Newfoundland. That's legit. It's about self-determination uh, in research for the people that are most affected by your research. Right, so it's an ethic, um, it's, it's fundamentally ethic, ethical to think about the relationship between the center and the periphery and the relations you want to have between those in issues of contamination. And it really uh, complicates this idea that power, when you exclude, is all about the center maintaining itself, as opposed to periphery maintaining itself through exclusion. Right, sometimes the periphery doesn't want to join the middle. Radical inclusion, it's a horrible idea. I don't want everyone in my pool. Not everyone. So, so this is this sort of starts these sort of ethics. So 
you start with theories of inclusion and exclusion and externality, and then you bring it into practice, and then practice takes you somewhere else, you're like, oh, I have to complicate this. That's the point of practice. While also doing things. So in the lab, we're also trying to think, okay, where does, where does the model of, of refusal put us in terms of modes of justice? What else can we do in the lab that puts us into different modes of justice? How are we going to imagine this and operationalize? This is what we ask uh, at all moments in the lab. Figure out where I am in this presentation. All right. So, one of the things that's really important to my lab and my research now is sort of seizing the means as opposed to just the ends of your research, right? Methodologies. How do you bake your values into methodologies, not just in your final object, but the whole way through, right? And our designers were talking about this today, right? The design process, not the end product, is where the thing is. The thingy being the good and the right. Right? And so by going, when I was going through the abstracts for this presentation and trying to come up with my awesome puns, uh, I was noticing a few places where we can start to do this work right now in our research right now. Again, regardless of whether you ever study or say the word jump again, these are things we can all be doing because as researchers, as students, as writers, as designers, what we do is we make the world. We are professional representers. Right? And so we're world makers and so we really have an ethical obligation to present the world in a way that we think is good and right. Oh, so let's do that. Let's think about how we do that. Number one, mankind. Some of you are still using mankind and one man's trash is another man's treasure in your abstracts. Don't do that. Don't let the male sort of remain the center and have the woman on the periphery and man actually stands for everyone, because it doesn't. It really doesn't. The second thing related to that is actually, oops, spoiler, everyone doesn't actually exist. There's no such thing as everyone. The human condition, we are all responsible for planetary degradation. We are horribly wasteful humans. Are there, that is isn't actually never true if you bring in case studies, because if we've just talked about how waste and externalizations and junk is about centers and peripheries and unevenness, when you talk about everyone, you've just lost that. And that's the whole point of why we're here. That's how systems work. Right? That's how you get the edges of the how you get junk in the first place. So you can never actually say we are all wasteful. Because we doesn't exist. We is the worst way to describe a socio-technical system. If you're going to use we, you have to talk about where the boundaries are, and how those boundaries are contained, and all these things, right? We in this room, pretty tight. Like we in general doesn't really exist. So think about that, right? When you're when you're when you're talking about systems and therefore power, there is no we. Right? Someone in in you know rural India and their waste practices and my waste practices are so different, they're incommensurate. That there is no every. So that's important, especially when you're talking about waste. The second thing I noticed, I'm gonna put this on a t-shirt now, and it is be like internet. There are all sorts of ways that this is true. Uh, one of the ways I would like to talk is that both of these are proper names for systems, for networks. It drives me crazy when people don't capitalize internet. It makes me furious when people don't capitalize indigenous. Right? Quick lesson on indigenous. Indigenous means all the folks in the world who are tribal in Canada, we call those Aboriginal. The reason that we started calling folks Aboriginal instead of First Nations, notice the capitals, is that First Nations is a proper name that comes out of, uh, what is that thing called, the government? The government to talk about all the folks who they have land treaties with. The thing about First Nations and land treaties is that neither the Métis or the Inuit have land treaties that are the same as anyone else. Inuit got none, and Métis have settlements. Right, and so instead of saying, uh, First Nations, which systematically excludes maintain Inuit, we now say <coughs> Aboriginal. Proper names, right? So sometimes people don't capitalize because they're talking about Indianity or Aboriginality. Um, those are not sort of universal, amorphous sort of things. Those comes out of particular people doing particular things in a particular way, a particular place, and so capitalized. And when you're talking about folks who are working and working to self-determine, to thrive, to fight. You need to capitalize that shit because it's just polite. Right? So please capitalize these words. This is the thing about externalizations and externalities and power and systems, is that they are ubiquitous and we're all already in them. Always already, already there. Right? And they manifest in things that seem as subtle and as benign as capitalizations in humans. Right? But because this is our job, because what we do is we represent as a job, whether we're designers or students or professors or faculty or researchers or interested people of the public, that's what we do. And so our job is to make like a punchline and put people in new places at every moment in our process. Thank you very much. Uh, before I give the Q&A, I wanted to mention that
that there are a couple of resources out there. Discard Studies blog, it's been running for five years. I started as a graduate student. Uh, more people know me as a blogger than a scholar. I know I publish on not the internet sometimes. <laughs> Uh, all about waste, wasting, externalizations, pollution, people's waste, all that sort of stuff. And also the action-based research methods. Uh, this is all about, so you can talk about feminist science and you know, whatever, uh, but how do you do feminist science? How do I titrate like a feminist? I want to do it, I, wanna, I believe you, I want to do it. That's what this is for. These are all, this is a bibliography of all field guides, how-to guides, not the philosophy of different methodologies, but actually how you get it in the trench. Uh, so that is there for you as well. So, questions, comments, concerns? Everyone's the last set of things. My funny people. You can't make jokes, jokes in isolation. You have to try them. <laughs> yes, Michelle Murphy? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Max. That was amazing. Um, so, you showed us the um, uh, the circle microscope picture of yeah. a bunch of microplastics, and you talked about um, how some of them were already microplastics, and then there's a kind of process of fragmentation that happens over time. So what kind of timescapes are we looking at when we're looking at that? Are we looking at microplastics that are 50, are we looking at 50 years? Are we looking at 100 years? Are we looking at five years? Like I was trying to wrap my head around timescapes of the yeah. generation of those microplastics caught in like an image of stuff. Right, so that doesn't depend entirely on context, right? So uh, on a beach where it's very sunny, the sun makes uh, monomers like BPA and phthalates come out of the plastic. Monomers are what make plastic very flexible. So once they migrate out, it becomes very brittle. So if you think, it, like if you let, let out like a kid's toy on the lawn and it's baked in the sun all summer, and then like when fall comes, if you can just smuck it a bit, it'll like fall apart because like it's bleached out. So that can happen within the summer, right, being on a beach. Um, when it's in the ocean itself, and there's not a lot of sun, and there's no oxygen, that can take hundreds of thousands of years, and it might never crack down, right? So it depends on, on where its uh, stressors are, how obvious its stressors are. The way in laboratories that we figure out whether plastics photo or biodegrade is you put them in, you put them in these jars full of uric acid, aka P, and you shine them in a bright light and you vibrate them really, really fast. And then you measure how the bonds are weakening. And then you mathematically extrapolate that to figure out how long it would take under that condition. Because as we know, most plastics exist in vibrating jars of bright lit pee. <laughs> uh, and you extrapolate that to figure out how long it's, and that's when you see those things that are like, plastic bake takes a thousand years, and the plastic whatever takes 10,000. That comes out of the pee test, right? So in, in most worldly hangout places that plastic are, we actually don't know how long it but we do know like on a bright and lit beach faster than in a landfill where there's no stressors compared to you know, the ocean. So it depends. But we do know that every plastic ever made is still on the planet because we haven't actually reached any of those even optimistic thresholds. And we do know that uh, plastics under most conditions will exist in geological time, which is longer than the human species will exist. Um, so that's why places like uh, El Bolina say plastics are forever. And that's actually an accurate, low resolution description of the temporal scale of plastics. <laughs> Yes. Are, are there means of reformulating plastics that such that they are biodegradable and still usable for their, their function? So people are working on that, um, usually in the rubric of bioplastics. The problem with bioplastics is either A, you actually make something that's plastic-like that is not plastic, like titan, which is like made like a beetle shell, or you make something that is plastic and still a polymer and breaks down in a thousand instead of a ten thousand year system, but then the other problem is that once they break down, we don't actually know what they break down into and whether those are more or less harmful. So there are some chemicals that, like BPA, isn't actually very harmful. So when BPA breaks down, then it becomes harmful. And we don't know if it's also happening with some of those things. I worked with a, a huge fight in public space, uh, aka television, with a uh, chemist who was working to make plastics that broke down faster, so they became more bioavailable for more microbes to eat them so that they happened in a 10,000 to 100 Thing. And I was like, you just made microplastics faster, which are the most dangerous size for more tropic levels. And he was like, yeah, but if you just think of like the long term, I'm like, but how, how it has to die for the long term? Anyway, we had this, right? So work is being done. Uh, yeah, from all sorts of different angles. But right now, if you make it biodegradable, it is therefore not that kind of polymer. So there are polymers in this world, like uh, hair and nails are made of polymers, right? And things, I mean, you lose your hair, it doesn't stay there for eternity, right? It's gone somehow, magically. 
And that's because hair and nails and shells and things like this uh, co-evolved with things that could eat them, and plastics haven't. So some things are catching up to plastics, right? If you starve some fungi or microbes and then put the equivalent of microbe sugar on plastics, they will eat it. Uh, it takes them a long time. They only do it under duress. And you can tell it's not successful because no one has freaked out about our bridges or our airplanes yet, right? Because if, if actually plastics became biodegradable, our infrastructure is way more screwed than that last presentation about how screwed our infrastructure is, right? So, yeah, that's the sort of terrain of biodegradable. This is sort of a big question, which you might not know the answer to. And that's natural, we think of natural ecosystems as being the perfect recyclers, that there's no waste, that everything is used. Is that, is that really true, or do natural ecosystems produce waste of any sort? Uh, well, natural processes produce waste all the time. The thing is, so there's nothing called modern waste. So this is Samantha McBride's term in an excellent book called Recycling and Consider that you can all read. Recycling and Consider, Samantha McBride. All right. So, um, the thing about modern waste is its tonnage toxicity and uh, heterogeneity is unprecedented, right? So, uh, if you look at archaeology, assuming archaeology looks at its garbage, right? Clay, clay never breaks down after you fire it. It's permanent. You've made a rock, right? That's a form of waste that doesn't get recycled, but it's benign. Clay is totally benign, and it's produced in small enough quantities that it doesn't matter. And even if you